you wouldn't know what I was talking about because the battery was dead most of the time I was talking, but I was recounting. I had seen a series, I rented a series at uh, the video store uh, from television. It was canceled after only one season. And the series was called, is called Luck, starring Dustin Hoffman and uh, a bunch of other people of great actors and uh, a Michael Mann project. Casting by Bonnie Timmerman, who also casted, you know, all his movies in Miami Vice and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, uh, Nick Nolte and just a b- bunch of unbelievably great artists. Anyway, so we're watching and I just suddenly remembered my childhood because I had grown up at, you know, basically around the racetrack and horse race people and gambling people and the mob and, you know, all, all of that that's tied in with sports. And especially to be seen at the racetrack, either at Santa Anita, Hollywood Park, or in the summertime, Del Mar, in North San Diego County. And my brother and I, like I say, instead of having a sitter for us, that we'd be dragged out to the track and even dragged out to nightclubs. And we were exposed to a lot of really pretty, yeah, there was a, abuse and things. <laughs> Kids shouldn't be exposed to that. Where the, 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 the these are adult mobsters and and criminals and gamblers and and actors and you know just kind of a, a wide array of characters. And you know if they have their drugs or their drink and, and everyone's doing drugs and drinking and all that way before the hippies and all the drug culture. And um, you know yeah they put their hands on you and sure <laughs> or any kid. So you, you had this kind of milieu, uh, you know, the, the, the mob. You can't call it the mafia. No, you know, today you would call it the Illuminati, you know, and the mob is just the muscle for the Illuminati. But they wouldn't refer to themselves as that. See what I mean? It was the hierarchy of Los Angeles. And, you know, and then, of course, there's Belmont Park, and then there's the you know, the Kentucky Derby and, you know, the rest of it, the rest of the circuit. And breeders and jockeys and amazing horses and uh, all the characters that are glued and tied to that thing, you know, rich and poor. Most who who you think are rich are really poor. And, uh, you know, the ones who are rich keep it a low profile. And, uh, you know, claiming races. All that was in this movie. It was like, How did Michael Mann know, who directed the first episode, how did he realize that a lot of his music was in there from the movie Heat and, oh yeah, I'm a, yeah, I was a big fan of of, of, of very talented, I only have like three or four directors at the top of my list who I consider to be really valid artists and he's one of the unsung heroes along with Stanley Kubrick who is my all-time favorite. And then to a lesser extent, there's a couple more, but it's not worth mentioning. And then let's just focus on the fact that this guy, I believe, is a visionary, often misunderstood. Now, here's the thing about the series. They didn't spoon-feed it to the stupid American public, which is stupid beyond all, all be, to the point of amazement, how much more stupid America is than it was, say, 10 years ago. To the point, of, to the point where people will confiscate their own guns so they ensure that they get their head blown off. I mean, it's just unreal. It's just, it's, I can't even look anymore. I, I, it's just so, the, 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 the American public is so infantile, juvenile, and, um, and self-righteous. Oh, I know, I'm talking mainly about the left. In this crowd I'm talking about, the, a lot of these were right-wingers. Or let's just say they were beyond politics. They, they were the ones who would put people in. For example, you had the, you know, the industrialists of my grandfather interacting with like the Lou Wassermans and the studio heads. And then they, they put in Ronald Reagan as governor after being president of the Screen Actors Guild so that he could be controlled to do laws favorable to Universal MCA Wasserman to, to be able to uh, uh, keep the actors 
from getting their own independent contracts. So here was where the union actually helped the actors, you know, to break away from the studio system. So all those struggles were going on, all those dirty politics, and all these people wound up at the racetrack because that was the only place of solace, as, as my, my father would call it, the outdoor insane asylum or the outdoor comfort zone. Take your pick. You know, the escape from reality. And, you know, to another extent, there was always sports gambling, always mafia figures driving us to school. There were any pleasure they wanted they could have. Push a button and they go to the front of the class. You know, just like you see in the Godfather movies, only more genteel. More of a facade, a snobbish facade on it. Um, and so, like I said, we grew up around all these characters. When I was watching the film, the series, it was like, these are all the people. If you look at it, you'll see that, you know, that I could identify all these kind of characters. It's like Michael Mann knew, or the writer of the series knew just exactly, you know, the jockeys and the trainers and the owners and the different people and the, and the, you know, the Hollywood thing and the mob thing and, and how it all interacts. And he had that all just down. I'm like, this guy must have been there. He had to have been there. I'm probably, maybe not. Maybe just a good fiction writer. But the guy that created the series, I think his last name is Milch. I, I, but I, I forget his first name. Anyway, it's the best series I've ever seen on TV. And uh, brought up a lot of memories, which I'm grateful for that I'm going to share with you. And how I come to a perspective, the perspective that I have today which I would not have had I not seen or been exposed to all this at a very young age, including a, a lot of what you might call abuse by, you know, people who are on drugs and then there are kids there that look pretty and they, they grab them, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was really, there's some things I just can't say, it's just too gross. But I mean, there was just a lot of that and a lot of um, out of control behavior from people that were, you know, the... I mean, a, a memory I have is a guy who was a film editor in Hollywood. He won, a, I think he won, you know, maybe a Golden Globe. I don't know what he's won. He, but he worked on the films that won Academy Awards. And there he was, all mad at my father because my father was gambling and bucks up and buying tickets. And he was broke and drunk and going on and on about his broken life and how awful it was and um, how mad he was at... I was just sitting there. I must have been seven years old. And he's screaming at me because, you know, I'm a kid of privilege. And after all, you know, he's now broke. And my father should give him some of his winnings. And I need to tell him that. And, and I'm just like, yeah, but what about all the losses? So he would sit in the box. And, and the box was, you know, on the finish line. And, uh, you know, at Santa Anita and, and at Hollywood Park. But Santa Anita is my memory here which is just east of Pasadena in uh, Los Angeles. And um, then so my dad would be very eccentric and he was, you know, they all kind of, people really loved him or they just didn't understand him. They didn't really hate him. They either loved him, but he was nuts. I mean, he was like in his own world, we lost, he'd throw his tickets up in the air all over the place, all over everybody. And then this guy would sit there in the, in the box and every time he would do that, he would get on his hands and knees and search the tickets to see if there was one that he might have mistaken because, you know, my father was known to put it away as well. And he had a driver named Ronnie. And they were out there literally every day. And Ronnie looked like, you know, he was a guy that, another connected made man. You know, the same people you see in Goodfellas. You know, it's basically it, only they're just more rich and more, I don't know, there's more of a polish on it, I suppose. You know, there's that air of high society, but most people don't realize how high society and the mob need each other like hand in glove. I mean, they need each other like symbiot like Siamese twins. Well, you don't have one without the other. Unless, you can't be a made man publicly and all pristine and everything unless you have the backing of these mobsters. And that's what I saw. And I never mentioned that to you until it was triggered by just watching this incredible thing. And it just brought me back to so many memories. 
like the guy. I mean, you can't make that up, right? The guy, the the, the award winning film producer. And I, I know he worked on things, something like Bridge on the River Kwai or something. I, you know, I, I don't. You know, maybe not that one, but you know, American movies he would recognize, right? Hands and knees, drunk, searching for. The, I, you know, and you can't, again, that's not something, that's not an incident you could make up, is it? You just wouldn't. I mean, even a, a screenwriter, a novelist trying to work on a novel or a screenplay, you wouldn't just make some. that would be a detail that would be uh, something that, uh, that a screenwriter would covet to put in his, to make the screenplay more real, but it, a detail like that. So there's a lot of these details, including abuse details, which are not, I'm not going to go into that. You know, suffice to say, the milieu I was in, the fact my brother and I were like taken to nightclubs at night and we interacted with, you know, at an early age, um, people like, like my friend who was also, he needs dead now and he was my age. He also went there to play pool to this place called the factory where everybody went at that time. And he played against Minnesota fats and beat him. And he was 13. And I remember I was the same age. And in there, you'd have the record executives and movie executives and, you know, the Jim Morrisons, the moms and pops, all these kind of people, you know, they're always, there's always a party or there's always a scene. And now I suppose it would be at various clubs, you know, along the strip. It's it's still happening. But tied to all that and to the music business and all that is this racetrack because they would wind up out there. People like, uh, uh, Jerry Weintraub and people like that who were concert promoters and music promoters and then they became movie producers and they're at the racetrack and there's all this. And it, it seems like the whole world winds up out there. Then afterwards, there's all the handicapping that was going on at the bar. And my you know, parents had a house with a bar and then have all the racetrack forms spread out and they'd be doing all the handicapping and keeping books and these people... And some of these racetrack people, like I say, were taking us to school. And uh, they were part of the mob. So we had like mobsters taking us to school. So that was quite a, yeah. And the whole thing they were into was, you know, basically the good life. In other words, the nice car, people opening the door for you, the limo, the getting out the, the table at Chasen's, the, you know, the... The, uh, the treatment, you know, and, and they would all aid and abet the guy that could get that treatment because they were working for him, all part of the system. They knew how to put on class and if they knew also how to take somebody out if they had to do that. It was like they could do both, you know. It's, it's, uh... But again, there would be no success of these industrialists, and by that I mean, you know, the top industrialists you've seen over the last... Well, we don't have industrialists like that. We have, I guess, Warren Buffett would be the closest thing. But when I mean industrialists, I mean they were... Warren Buffett doesn't really move anything politically. These people were... They were the kingmakers. They were the people that got people elected or tossed out or killed. You rest in peace, Jack Kennedy. (laughs) You know? And then that mob element also goes to today's drug trafficking. But these are the same people I grew up with. Same people I knew that you could see them all at the racetrack. And they all, all the mobsters were there with their lawyers. And we remember, I kept thinking of this guy, Johnny Roselli, and then he had his lawyer there, a guy named Cantillon, who was like, you know, he, who got me out of scrapes with drugs. I mean, he had to represent me. Or when I was in trouble... <laughs> And um, so I had mo- a mob lawyer on my side when I was in trouble with drugs. They were going to send me to jail, and I needed representation. So I had a mob lawyer uh, represent me. And I suppose, and then, you know, there was a dark, you know, people get killed. And, you know, and my mother would always tell me a story like, well, he was just out getting his mail, and someone just drive by, drove by and or it was in a helicopter or something, and he just got shot from a long distance. Well, they never found out who did it. And I'm like, so, you know, that was the description of a mob hit that never got resolved. I said, well, what did he do? And um, there was never really an explanation of what he did. But it would be just like someone from their 
society would be removed. So the society, again, looked like when you're talking about this pristine society with the country clubs and the, and the gl- nice lawns and the, and the private schools and the, um, and, the, and the charity ball and the big to-do and this or that, and then you realize the way it really works. I mean, you know, you know, it's this is you know people have seen this on TV shows like the Chicago show they had recently with the mayor. There's a movie out now about with Russell Crowe as the mayor, the corrupt mayor. And, you know, and the way those cities work, and you know, you can see the way Rahm Emanuel and the. But I just couldn't see. You see, at that time, I just wanted to remain naive. I just kept going back into uh, an alternate personality that didn't experience any of that because of being traumatized at that age from um, what you would call abuse, what they would call just goofing around, I guess. I don't know. Um, so that, that was quite an education that I had forgotten about. I mean, by the time I was seven, I knew how the city worked, uh, what happens to undesirables, um, how they're disposed of, um, how to you know hire people to get rid of other people you don't want, how it all coalesces, who runs the city, all the the, the socialites and glitter glittery people and celebrities owe their very existence to the mob. Entertainment, financing, hotels, gambling, Vegas, the racetrack, horses. Uh, the, the beautiful people you see all owe, every one of them owes their existence in the spotlight to the mob. Their existence and protection to the mob. In other words, trusting mammon and uh, bowing down to mammon and, and, and then you know, competing to be the top dog. But all of these people who are at the top owe other people and are handled. There is no one who's really just floating above it all. So that too we'd seen. Now the way my brother handled it, he was traumatized completely. He took on a, he he literally took on a personality like he was John Lennon. And then he got this Asian girlfriend that he, he called Yoko or whatever, you know. And he would drive around in his Porsche 928 back in the day, and um, living in this complete fantasy world where she was manipulating him all the way into his death. So there was that. And my mother had sued that woman for a million dollars wrongful death and got it. Even though she was laughing at the funeral, how happy she was that this retard was gone. I know, that all seems inhuman, doesn't it? You don't really understand how brutal it is. You know, if you'd seen it from the inside out, you get a clue, but most people I know that seen it from the inside out, they're still too traumatized to actually put it into character that can be palpable to the mass of humanity the way a movie like The Godfather could. But it still puts a distance between you and, you know, you add the perversions and the, and the really dark stuff and, you know, to the violence and the fact that um, nobody is free up the ladder. In other words, you see these celebrities, you go, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be one of them and just run around the world all free? And they're not free. You still have people that, you know, like poor James Taylor, you know, he's out there still having to hump it. it it's it's uh, amazing because, I mean, these guys had all done music for money. They sold out for money. They weren't really interested in you know, like we do music out of the joy of doing music. James Taylor, as folky as he is, that wasn't what it was about. He wanted to write hit music, and he had to make the right connections uh, and with the mob, or he wouldn't have been lifted up there to be this James Taylor, all this man of peace. He's no man of peace. He made his decisions what to do with his talent. It's just you think, James Taylor, you know, uh, really... You know, I mean, he seems so innocent. It's like, not, not really. You know, they can sing about innocent things in the hopes that one day they'll be innocent again. But there really isn't in the entertainment business. It's, 
you know, basically you're going to have to play ball. You have to recognize there's a mob there. They recognize there's muscle there. Recognize there's big money there. Recognize it's tied in with gambling, prostitution, drug trafficking, weapon trafficking, wars, rumors of wars, and every ill thing you can think of on the earth, including nasty politics that bring about uh, satanic things like sacrificing babies to Molech at late-term abortion, which the mills are ginned up full tilt, thanks to your brilliant leader, Obama. Well, I think, you know, cynically, he hopes that his behavior will be so bad that God will smack down the uh, America because of him, and that way he'll be able to get his enemies, which is every American is his enemy, because he was abandoned as a kid, you know, so he wants to take it out on the rest of the world. And that's basically what he does. And as he says, I'm fixing it, I'm fixing the middle class, he's destroyed the middle class, so they will never, ever come back. Instead of fixing the economy, he doesn't even talk about it. He says, let's just keep running up the spending debt. His intention is to destroy every last one of you, but you're so stupid that you're so stupid that you're beyond even... You, you, it's like a... What do you say in Italian? You say, uh, oh, what's that word? I'm not going to call you crazy, but... Uh, He's just so dumb that Americans would be stupid enough to give up their guns and think the government will protect them. This is the biggest load of... that. You have to be a complete retard to think something like that. No one's going to protect you, buddy. Nobody but you. You call the cops when you... They come for a home invasion. You'll be dead. They'll be just sweeping up around and tagging your toe at the morgue. What are you talking about? You're responsible for your own security, man. You give up your guns, America. You know, I <coughs> spit on you. That's all you're good for. And then I cheer when you get your comeuppance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Home invasion. Whole family killed to rob family of $25. Yay! You deserve it, stupid. You're responsible for your own security. I'm being facetious here. I'm just trying to make a point. America is called by the world at large. America the stupid. Not land of the free and home of the brave, but because of the liberals, and some conservatives, so-called. It's called the land of the stupid. We laugh at you openly. We guffaw, says China, who's about to take over all federal lands. Because you, America, you are so stupid, and I'm glad not to count myself among you. Because I fought you every inch of the way since I was a child. And it turns out now, and I'm doing a song about this, yeah, it's going to take a while because I'm making it high production value. It's a real simple guitar part, but I'm going to make it high production in terms of trying to put it over so you accept it. Because when I said America was done, it was really done. But America the stupid, the, the world says, laughing. <laughs> Look at them now. They think if they give up their guns, they're going to be able to be protected. <laughs> they vote for Obama. They think Obama's going to give them a hand up. It's not a hand out. It's a hand up, they'll say. <laughs> you bought the lie. Stupid. I used to think America was stupid in 1990, but then I realized I had superior knowledge than most people, because I already knew the whole conspiracy when I was 10 from the inside out. And these people are just Johnny come lately. They're still calling them the Illuminati, which, again, they don't refer to that themselves as the Illuminati. No, uh, the elites who are what you say the Illuminati would laugh at you if they heard you say the word Illuminati. So when we see the conspiracy people saying Illuminati, we know, or MK Ultra or Monarch or any of those things, we know that they don't know. We know that they don't know anything. I've done interviews with people who said they're monarchs and this and that, and 
you know, I've gone along with it. But I mean, you know, the bottom line is, as I remember more and more about my own childhood, that was never mind control, psychiatrists, drugs, sports, gambling, mob, uh, this, that, the whole thing, the whole big wide world runs off that mob. You know, and they take an oath to Lucifer. That's, that's right. And if their kids don't, then they like, they shoot horses, don't they? They pull up lame. They uh, usually get rid of them unless there's extenuating circumstances where God might protect. Sometimes they encourage them to go into the priesthood or go get a farm somewhere. You know, but they're very adamant about you can't have people doing crime. And if, if, the, if the kid you're bringing up objects to it, He's going to be a problem. You've got to get rid of him, and it's up to that family to get rid of that problem who are in that criminal cabal. And that's the way it's been from the beginning of time. From King Herod to Nimrod, to all of them. Back to Cain. I mean, to all of them. So you get an understanding about this. In my case, I was just considered uh, insane, and they passed a rumor around L.A. that I was dead and you know I was obviously the embarrassment so I was uh shuffled off to the midwest where I was never going to be heard from again and so that was you know another acceptable uh, outcome after assassination attempts and everything else no I mean there was the the guy that was putting a hit on me when I was like 18 he was uh, uh he was a composer in LA he'd worked on some shows part of the entertainment mob complex and, and basically, he uh, ended up being a teacher in a college in Colorado and was kind of like in charge of me. And he was the one that, uh, an Italian guy, that's right, he was also a made man in the mafia. And he, there are stories about that too. But I mean, look, the point is, with all of this, with my own personal experience of growing up at the racetrack around the mob, around the whole, the whole thing, the whole thing, I've seen the whole thing. I might have tried to blot a lot of this out, but I've seen the whole thing. I'm not angry with it. I'm not in denial about it. I'm kind of, I'm not really a fan of the people that tried to put on airs when they're just as much, their hands are just as dirty and they're just as much in the mob as, as the guys like Lucky Luciano, you know, but who would then put on airs like they're all pristine and clean and they work for the Children's Foundation and they're above it all. That, that snobbery I thought was disgusting. I'd call, I, see, I'm more disgusted with that. See, I know what they do. You say, well, they murder people. Well, of course they have from the beginning of time. What are you talking about? Anyone that gets in the way is whacked. Next, their perversion. Yes, anything but the missionary position is basically what they're all about and with as many people as possible next drugs yep they run the drug trade around the world i thought that was the cia nope no the cia are bit players they're just functionaries i thought it was the the cartel in baja you know the uh um the sinaloa cartel nope they work for somebody much higher than them Yep, and you never see any of this because they own all the TV stations. They own entertainment and sports. They own the racetrack. But it's a shifting sand because it's not any one guy that owns it. I mean, it's just, it's like a force that controls it all, right? Through the people that are there. You know, the, the jockeys, the trainers, the, 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 uh, the big time mob bosses, their lawyers, the big above it all executives, um, and, the, and the, the, the mayor of the city and the, and the actors and the, the celebrities and the whole thing is all connected to one. Okay? We'd seen all that by the time I was, like I say, seven. I had already had my education and went into denial because I was thinking, you know, still believing in the Wizard of Oz or the fairy tales or Santa Claus, you know, and I just didn't want to get... I just didn't want to grow up. I mean, I just didn't want to accept that this was the price and the price had to be paid. I, I couldn't take, you know, I just, I, I felt like, and then more and more, it was like, they didn't know me, I didn't know, you know, it was just, it was just not going to work out. I just, 
I bounced off the mirror. And, I, you know, I did all the things. I mean, I was a sinner big time, and I took drugs, and I jumped into sex, and I did this. But, I mean, I wasn't a murderer or really a good liar. But, I, you know, still, I should, that should have qualified for something. <laughs> and, it, and, of course, it didn't. You actually have to renounce God. It's kind of a hard thing to accept. But I didn't I couldn't accept it till I was an adult later in life. I just remained kind of a you know, like what I accuse the US of being stupid and infantile. I was stupid and infantile infantile in the way that I did not accept what I knew to be true. What was my experience on a daily basis? at a very young age, and what I seem to have forgotten until I watched that TV series. And then I'm rattling off to Trish about the betting and baseballing and pick six and this winner and that winner and how you, and how you bet and gamble. And when I looked at the ticket, they didn't even explain it. They didn't even explain it. I looked at the ticket. I looked at the winning ticket, and the guy said, okay, give me your pick six picks. And all they showed you was the ticket. Nobody explained to the audience what it meant. So I started explaining it to Trish. I started saying, well, okay, so it's the one horse in the first race, second race, the three, four, five. We're going to bet the one horse against the three, four, five, this six horse in the third race, uh, five and eight horse in the, uh, and on down to the sixth race. We're going to bet all that against every horse in the sixth race, hoping that throughout the whole thing, the long shot comes in, Right. And the take got to be $2.8 million for that pick six. And these guys had the ticket. But if you didn't know what you were looking at, you would not have understood the whole thing as it was going down. You wouldn't have understood that. So I explained it to Trish because I've been through it a million times. I had to get the tickets and uh, hold the tickets. And um, I had to write down, like, you know, the, the bets that my father and his friends wanted to make. And I had to keep track of it. I didn't know what all the different terms were. I even had to... No, this is when we were on good terms. I mean, there was a time I was on good terms where it, it was the, the main issue between me and my family was just that, you know, abuse and Satanism just wasn't, you know, it wasn't really for me personally. And, and they said, but you can't say that. And, then, you know, there was a problem. So, um, yeah. Oh, you look at a, a guy like Glenn Becker or uh, Bill O'Reilly... They're dirty as hell. What are you talking about? There's no way. <laughs> I know. It's like I'm Satan. I know everybody's dirty laundry. I got everybody by the balls, baby. You hear me? I know where all the bodies are buried and everybody by the balls. Everybody, nobody walks free. You want to be in the limelight? You pay me, Lucifer. Period. Franklin Graham, oh yeah. Billy, oh yeah. All those jerks on TBN, ha ha ha, all those fakers, ha ha ha. Pedophiles, thieves. What I don't like about them, the same thing I don't like about the high society. They put their noses up in the air when they're no better than the Don Corleone family. You know, at least that's more out in the open. At least that's more honest. I'll take the mob guys any day over the uh, high society people. Because, you know, I understand that. I, that, that. That's basic. At least they're honest. And so, in that regard, I thank the people in my life who work for my father, who told me the facts of life at an early age, and who were like my mentor. They were, you know, they were like, yeah, they were dealing cocaine to the hotels and they were, and celebrities and different things, you know. And I was staying in their house when I was troubled and running away from home and I was staying in their houses. And uh, they, they were running their businesses and, you know, running their mob stuff. And, and it was all right in front of you. It was all in the open, you know. And they were, and they were good to me. See, they, they were, they, they, there was like, it wasn't strange and crazy and perverted and, and, and this, all created by this need to be pristine and bury all that. There is not one made man in any of these cities with their suits and ties and their charitable events who has his hands clean 
and who deserves it. Not one. They're there because they position themselves better than somebody else that competed, whatever. But it's like, you know, this, well, I can't say not one. I mean, I know, I'm not talking about wealthy people. I know quite a few wealthy people who don't have anything to do with that. You know, who made it the old-fashioned way. They earned it, you know. I'm talking more about sports, entertainment, um, glittering stuff. And I guess to a certain extent politics. I'm not talking about a guy who goes out and drills some oil fields and fights off the competition and makes some money. I, I'm not talking about that. Or entrepreneurship, no. Let's make that distinction before we get carried away. And if I have the balls to put this thing up, then I guess they grew a few more inches. No, because it's like an embarrassment, you know, to, to have to... So what's the end result with me? The end result with me is I don't trust anyone who's coming to me with some kind of a, you know, there's different angles. And, and it's, it's not like it's, it's happening like it was when, in my youth. But I don't trust people, for one thing. And my father taught me that, thank God. And uh, I have to rely on the counsel of the Lord because the, the most corrupt people that have come at me have been Christians. And, that, you know, I found out that they're doing the same thing as what I saw in the entertainment business at the racetrack and with the heads of the, the bosses of Los Angeles and the mafia and the mob and the rest of it and all how it all works and Vegas and sports and airplanes and Lockheed and Northrop Grumman and all this military industrial complex. Oh, yes, that's all interwoven with it, too. And Palm Springs and Palm Desert and Indian Wells and Bob Hope and blah, blah, blah. And it goes on and on and on. And I was exposed to all of that and all those people and, and the rest of them. Again, these pristine people would walk around. You'd see them at the Beverly Hilton Hotel and they'd have their noses up in the air like they were better than the, the criminal element that put them there. Which I thoroughly, I guess that's, what, that's why I got booted out of my family, I think. Be, you know, in a way, because of uh, pointing that out, because that really made them mad. That will make them more mad than, uh, than you know, disapproving of their perversion, Satanism, whatever, to have their wealth or whatever, it, you know, or what they think they need to do to have wealth, which, of course, is ridiculous, because what I saw was a dwindling of wealth, not an amassing of it, and the more perverted they got, the more it dwindled. What do you think about that? Selling out to Satan more and more, doing more and more bad things, and it's dwindling. So that theory doesn't work, does it? That's a lie. So I'd seen all this, made those conclusions, and went my way. And uh, my brother didn't make it, but at long last, I have made it. I see it all clearly. No rose-colored glasses. I accept it. I have total forgiveness in my heart because if I were one of them, I'd do the same thing. So therefore, there but for the grace of God go I. It's so vast that you really can't get on them. You almost have to develop, you you naturally come into the same uh, emotional state as Jesus. Lord, forgive them for they know not what, you really don't hold a grudge. You know, I have actually fond memories from, of, mobsters and shady characters and seems like the criminals were more or overt, like I said, were the, the nicest people and the most straight shooting. I know this is going to sound strange to you, but they were the ones who were nice to us, nice to my brother and me. And, you know, it's, the, it's everybody else who wants to the kids have to compete and they got to go to this school, that school. And, you know, who are you fooling? Becoming a lawyer, becoming a politician, becoming someone that works in the studio. Who are you fooling? Who are you fooling? You are seen as what you are and who's got you by the you know what? You know, uh, whereas the mob people, they made no bones about it. They were just, you know, it was on the table and uh, 
Therefore, nobody had to hide anything. Everything was, you know, there's kind of a code of justice, a code of honesty. And, you know, yeah, yeah, there's the brutality. See, in high society, you never see the dirty work or the brutality. But, say, if you're in prison, it's a daily thing. And usually if someone gets whacked, there's, you know, a reason for it. And it usually ties into, to, to, you know, the rules of engagement vis-a-vis the mob. You know, drug dealing, turf, territory, whatever. But at least to me, that's honest. Here's your turf. You're guarding your turf. You kill those people. You take over that corner. You know what I mean? And that's one-on-one. So the thing I don't like is when these people go up the ladder, they act like they don't have anything to do with that corner uh, drug pusher when they employ that guy. Anyway, so the movie had all this in it. I mean, you know, it, it didn't have perversion in it. H- HBO wouldn't allow it to have, like, underage prostitutes or whatever, you know, whatever your, your you know, whatever their pleasure is, they dial it up, and, you know, whatever. It's, th- there's no need to go into that. But, see, a lot of survivors of satanic ritual abuse and, and all this stuff, they get all hung up on the sex part. They think that sex is, you know... They, they, because they were used themselves or prostituted as children, and you know that they've had to adjust that. So all they knew was the sex, but that, that's all they saw was sex. They never saw the wider picture of everything. When it goes to the president of the United States as a criminal in chief of, of and who was employed by the mob, and Chicago and Vegas, L.A., I mean, what do you think you're looking at? You know, why were the Godfather series so successful? Because everyone, to a larger or lesser extent, realizes that in some way they work for the mob. In some way there's, you know, right? And then for the astute, which of course there's almost none in America anymore, but for the astute, the spiritual implication is they've, all these people have given their oath and, the, and they become fit extensions for the demonic realm which operates through them they don't run the system, you know, this Dustin Hoffman guy in, in uh, Luck, he doesn't run the system. It's run through them by their God, if you will. And it goes by itself. They can't tell you who's going to get whacked and who isn't. It's just, it's a process of, it's just a natural process. The one thing I really saw, though, when I saw the whole racetrack milieu and all the different characters from all different walks of life interacting with it, is I saw the, 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 the brilliance of this series showing you the entire cross-cut of humanity in kind of concentrated form around the racetrack, because they all go there, you know? The racetrack is like a metaphor for life, okay? And um, so I remembered all that. I remember my education when I was young, and I remember how much I, I did admire the mobsters who, uh, who were honest. You know, I say, this is the way the world... And then eventually I just couldn't handle it. But I mean, at that point, it was like, you know, my, they were straight shooting me. And, and while the parents and the uncles and the aunts and the, and the uh, friends and their parents and whatever, they were all going nod, nod, wink, wink. I hate that. I'd rather, you know, talk to the mob guy who I don't care if he's a hitman or what. At least he is honest. I mean, not every time, but the ones I had encountered was the, was the breath of honesty that, that, that uh, actually helped me to get through and cope with what I was looking at because I was very confused. I didn't understand how they could go to a charity and then be, have this dark underbelly thing, you know? Then there's a movie out about Mickey Cohen. Mickey Cohen was very much you know, part of the mob that serviced these elites, and um, he was running his own show as well in L.A. And uh, apparently he too did not like the hypocrisy of the hoity-toity. But anyway, so there it is. You can't complain about it because it goes to entertainment, it goes to politics, it goes to the President of the United States, it goes to the Governor of California, it goes to every, you know, Governor of Chicago, it goes to every, you know, and all the other cities in between and all the cities around the world and all the corruption. It all ties in. So... I would say that looking at the odds, okay, just being, having common sense, that, and what you're looking at is Satan's world, okay? It's Satan's world. And all, I always wondered why all these people had signed on. It's not like they signed on to do their specific task. They signed on in the spirit and then were given that specific task. 
And that's kind of like those career paths opened up. And then, you know, then there's the dark side, which is the communist side, which, which a lot of these, uh, again, I was around a lot of, these were the, the, the capitalists, <laughs> including the Italian mafia, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, to, the, the drug dealers. These are, these are capitalists, the Sinaloa cartel and Baja California. Those are capitalists. These uh, Colombian Coke dealers, they were capitalists. The, you know, Don Corleone and the mob and the Godfather, these are capitalists. These, uh, these uh, movie moguls and whatnot, these were capitalists. There's a dark side. That's the communists. <laughs> and these capitalists don't like the communists. And both have their allegiances with Lucifer, whether it's through masonry or through whatever, through 58 degrees, this and that, you know. So it's just really, uh, you know, a view. And, and the reason kids commit suicide when they can't handle it or they're pure hearts or they just can't corrupt themselves into something like that, the reason they all commit suicide, many of them, is because they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't know the Word of God and they don't know that what I just described is exactly what is in the Bible. There is just no, if you know the Bible, what I described to you, you don't bat an eye. I have friends that go, ah, it's just Satan's kingdom. What the heck? You know, what's, why, why name the specific aspects of it? It's just, it's all the same. But, and the other reason they commit suicide is because they, re, they think it's so big a problem that they can never find a place in this world. So they off themselves. Um, friends, Jesus said, I have nowhere to lay, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Do you understand that? You're not supposed to, if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, Yahweh Elohim, Yahushua, the one, Messiah Adonai, you know, if you belong to him, you are not ever going to, you know, and, and, and I have news for you. They, any of us, any human being on earth, I don't care what your affiliation, whether it's to Satan, your guild, your school, your this, your that, doesn't matter. None of you and none of me and none of us and none of them and none of anybody is going to have a place to lay our heads because whether we like it or not, the clock is ticking. And I was thinking last night as I was watching this series, and I recommend it highly. I, I can't wait to see the next. We watched two episodes, the first two, and I'm definitely hooked. I'm just sad that they canceled the series. And there's two reasons. One, there were horses that, that got killed in the making of the story. Because you can break a leg, you know, and when you break a leg, you have to... There's a scene that's very painful where a horse, you know, when, when a horse pulls up lame, they, they, that means they break... More often than not, they break a leg. It just splinters right there on the track. The horse is lying down. They come over and they euthanize the horse right on the spot. That minute, there's no more suffering. Because if a horse can't get up, if a horse's leg is broken, he has to be put down on the spot. That's it. And, uh, oh yeah, there's pain with respect to the animals and how they're treated. And, and, uh, and that's what the Nick Nolte character is all about. And, uh, he's got a three-year-old colt that, uh, could beat every horse anywhere in the world, but he won't run it because he thinks they're going to kill this horse like they did his, his father, you know? So anyway, so you get to see all that. So the, the, it just brought back all the memories I had blocked out, I guess, all the time that I had spent at the racetrack and all the racetrack people and all the, you know, characters and many of whom were, you know, producers in the movies and, you know, moguls in this industry or that, you know, they were all, and, and the mob people and they were all just kind of all connected together and I, I, had, for, I had not forgotten, I just never really emphasized it. I, I mean, to tell you, I'm, I'm not only at peace with it, but I'm when I saw that, you know, the first thing a kid would think, and that's really what I just remained. I had to remain, a, you know, I had to just go into denial. I just, at, at a certain point, I blocked it all out. You know, I, I didn't want to believe there was no Santa Claus. I didn't want to believe the world was like what I had seen at that age. So I guess I started kind of, even when I was around them, I was blocking it out. It was like, oh, uncle so-and-so. Oh, hey. And I never attributed that, you know, they could be a ruthless killer or a drug dealer. It never occurred to me. You know, I, I just couldn't connect that. I couldn't believe that. 
They were such nice people, to me anyway, a lot of them. That insane film editor guy, yeah, he was just crawling around in the ground every time my father would, you know, throw his tickets all over the place and he would, you know, try to find one where he made a mistake. I can't, apparently that happened before. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing seeing a guy who had edited Academy Award winning films and also, you know, Westerns and, you know, early Hollywood. And he was, you know, broke and out begging. It, it, I saw that. I think that disturbed me more, a lot more than anything else. See, how does that happen? I thought a guy who's editing films like that, that's a big job. Uh, you know, USC, before it had a film school, but USC grad and all that, you know crawling around on the floor looking for a ticket. But all of this went to my own education. I saw a lot of that. I saw a lot of that. Broken men, broken men, left and right and center everywhere. And I'm here to tell you, and I'm here to tell any, anybody out there that's caught up in this, you, your only way out is Jesus Christ. And you don't have to go to church to get him. You just gotta, you gotta just get into the word, get into the spirit and ask the Lord to forgive you and, and ask him to show you what the truth is about himself. And you'll see that he was here. He is real. He, he returns, but there, it, it, it's, it's a spiritual walk, you know? It's a personal relationship. And that's, you know, and yes, people make a joke. Well, I, some, you know, ex-porn star, I saw her, became a friend of mine on Facebook. Why? I don't know. She was into conspiracy theory and, you know, Alex Jones and all that. So, And she had a page where she was like... Um, you know, overtly uh, sexual imagery and, you know, but, but legal, but I mean, had been an ex porn star. And on her page, she goes, uh, well, I, um, you know, don't worry. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the porn industry. She goes, don't worry. I haven't, I haven't found Jesus or anything like that. And I thought to myself, that is sad. Um, you know, find Jesus. Now we have all these rules you get to break and it makes all, all the perversion even more exciting. But, you know, um, I guess the one good thing I could say about porn stars is that they're capitalists. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I just don't have any opinion of it one way or the other. I mean, you know, I left. Well, was that a good thing? I mean, you know, does that, that mean you have virtue with Jesus? He was friends with prostitutes. Are you kidding me? And I'm not saying a porn star is a prostitute, but I mean, it's kind of the same thing. You're doing sex for money, right? So it's a form of prostitution. But, you know, the Lord doesn't judge things like that. He takes them as, as you are to make a comment like, don't worry. In other words, even though I think this woman, this woman is a, uh, a conservative, is what I believe. You know, she's a, like a constitutionalist. She's, she's for the rule of law. I, I have that feeling. But this idea is don't worry leftists because I have acting aspirations, maybe, or singing or something. Don't worry leftists, I haven't found Jesus, so I'm still okay. You're better off putting it on your sleeve. Yes, worry, I found Jesus, and Jesus, 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 Jesus. I don't care if Billy Graham fakes it, it's Jesus all the way. Yeah, and besides that, I, Billy Graham, at least he speaks the word of God. I just don't have any malice in my heart about any of it anymore. I, you know, at this point of life, I have uh, let it go. I don't have any, you know, you know, if I say someone's a criminal, it's a factual, it's not like a, a pejorative term, oh, you're evil. It just means they chose that path in life, you know. The best policy is to be honest, you know. When you're dealing with people in business, if you're honest, you'll have an honest go. You know, you don't, you don't cheat on money. You don't hoard money. You don't do this. You don't, you know, you, if you, you got to pay your shareholders, you pay them. You know what I mean? You don't move stuff around, cook the books. When you start going down that path, um, there will be hell to pay down the road. We reap what we sow. And if you join this satanic system, like our poor editor did, look, what, what the, he was part of the USC cinema mafia early on before they had a cinema school. Well, what the heck? Is crawling around on the ground like that. I thought Satan was supposed to protect his own. Why are all these broken men out there at the racetrack? You know, they used to be somebody crawling around. They, they got going with the old Satan early on and, and life was a dream. What happened to that? With Jesus, it's permanent. 
in Christ, there is permanence. He is the rock. With the Lord, he is the path. With the Lord, there is the truth and being at rest with it. And in the Lord, there is forgiveness. As you're forgiven, we forgive others. Well, the absurdity of that is it's, it's, it's a kind of a no-brainer that we should forgive. Well, well am I ever going to forgive America for becoming stupid? Uh, yes, I, I, I do. I, I understand. You know, I do. I, I get mad at it, but I forgive it at the same time, you know? I guess that's what's, what's irritating me more than anything else is people willing to give up their, their liberty for security uh, and their, um, their sovereignty and integrity for a handout. I just I find that to be... Uh, I, well, I understand it. I mean, you know, it's like, well, yeah, let's cut spending, but don't cut mine. You know, I understand that. You know, I'm used to the government dole now, and I, I need my... And I'm not saying to be like Ronald Reagan and throw all the mental hospital patients out on the streets or anything and have a teams of wandering derelicts. I, I didn't think that was cool. You know, I, there's probably a reason for the interplay between, you know, conservative and liberal and, you know, looking out for the little guy and not seeing people get shafted just because they don't have any defense. But uh, if it swings too much one way or the other, you get into trouble. If it swings too much toward the liberal side, you get, you know, bankruptcy of the state. And then nobody gets any money and nobody gets survival. Too much the other way, um, you get people, you know, who are in need, um, hurting and with no help, suffering and dying in a country that has, is plentiful. That's disgusting. Right? And also the responsibility of taking care of our own, meaning, you know, those the Lord puts, if we all take care of the people that the Lord puts in our path, then in general, the world, the whole world would be taken care of. But because we don't, reaping what we sow, looking the other way, what ends up happening is then, then you have the nanny state because you're not doing it, so the nanny state will do it. There's a kind of a justice in all this, isn't there? There's a justice in the Chinese taking over all the federal lands. That's why they don't want you walking on it or squatting it or harvesting the wood or you know, digging, drilling for oil. They don't want you doing any of that stuff because the Chinese own it because of the, there has to be a collateral for the debt. And the people can't pay it back, so the Chinese get to confiscate all the lands. Don't you find that almost like poetic justice? With, with, and, and what the liberals will do, you know, the leftists, uh, rather the Marxist communists, is they will learn Chinese. And because they want to see their enemies, the conservatives, Gun down, and hopefully maybe the Chinese will do it as soon as the gun confiscation is done because the Chinese ordered Obama, their little bitch, to grab the guns so they could, uh, you know, feel more at peace by invading America, <laughs> literally. And as I look at all this, I'm like, oh, you mean these people are too stupid to figure out two plus two is four? That somebody's got to pay the debt? And I'm talking about people, uh, when I say stupid, I mean our smartest people. I mean, guys like, what's his name on TV? Uh, Chris Wallace. He seems as dumb as anybody I've ever seen in my life. And and even pundits, the pundits, you know, the Juan Williams is the Charles Krauthammer is the Chris Matthews seems like an absolute derelict fool, an IQ of three. And it goes on and on and on and on. I mean, it'll go around the room. Well, that dumbing down process, these people have whip-smart brains. They have tremendous educations and, and are, are gifted in the gift of communications and uh, media. You would think that they would have figured it out instead of um, you know, defending the destruction and their own elitism. But uh, again... In looking at it, you have to take step back and take a view of, okay, fallen humanity. That the brightest and best among us would be among the most fallen, and that the more the ne'er-do-wells, the people that seem a bit derelict or whatever, they would be the more pure hearts 
they would actually be the smarter. It would be backwards to what a real world would be like, almost in every way. And yet the sun rises, the clouds are beautiful, the breeze comes in, the birds are chirping, and all should be right with the world. I talked to someone yesterday about, you know, that we want to focus on restoration on the song Kelly wrote, wrote when uh, on the Sword and Dove album. You have to buy the album, by the way. You have to buy the CD. And it may take a little bit to get it, but I mean, you have to buy the CD so you can listen to it all the way through in that order. And uh, you can get the CD in the Reverb Nation store, and I have to mention this. And that's an interesting, you know, because we have artwork and we have some words there. We have, you know what I mean? It's, it's like it's a whole package. And it's a very enjoyable way to go. And then you get, you know, and, and yeah, you'll finally get to your favorite songs and you'll have like two or three of those and then put those on your iPods and whatnot. But um, it will be uh, in iTunes and Amazon and everything as a download whenever that, you know, it's been submitted and it's under review. And then, you know, it takes a little time, a few weeks to get it there. But in the interim, you can get a CD uh, uh, from uh, the Reverb Nation store and or download all the tracks right now and that's that's kind of what i like about reverb nation that um they allow that kind of thing and 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 no there was a lot of people that put their blood sweat and tears into this not a lot but there were you know people and and money was spent and things were done and that's why we we have it for sale because it's it's would be completely unfair and insane to just give it away after who's going to pay for it if all this you know um, all this stuff was bought and paid for so that you could have it, then do you really want to have it for free and want us to just eat it? Is that what you want? How many tracks have I given you for free? How much podcast? How much of my life? You know, and a lot of that was, you know, a lot of money spent so that you could have it for free. So when there's an album, I just look at it like that's a commercial thing and that's not like a donation thing. You know, that's that that should be like, you know, Paul applying a trade of making tents and then he was preaching, right? So we give this, the word out for free and we give lots of tracks out. But this is seriously, I mean, you had a, uh, you know, a Grammy award winning producer mixing on it, like several of the tracks. And that was, um, you know, he, as he was putting my studio in and different things. And now that costs money. I mean, come on, you know, as long as we're going to be talking about the mob and horse racing and capitalism and, you know, there's a, then there's a good side. We take a risk. And we're hoping that to share the album with the world. And the only way that can happen is if it gets picked up from here and massively distributed because of being popular or put on the radio or something. And any of you in that regard could help instead of just treating us like a, a poor relation while you go download Britney Spears. You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We're brethren. She's maybe not brethren, but, you know, we've, we've, we, we realize how our own disses us. You know, um, yeah, the mixes, the albums, the projects, I'm sure will all become technically, you know, better in the future. But this was a pretty, pretty dynamic effort on your behalf. So you could have music that came from the Holy Spirit and not from commercial shittyanity. Which I hate, by the way. And I hate their bookstores and I hate their music and I hate everything about it. Hence the term shitty entity. I, I think that's better than, I think that term is better than, um, what is it? Churchianity? Nah, shitty entity is more like it. You know, these people are ruled by the same system as the racetrack and entertainment and everything else, but they got their noses sky high. And, and it's that hypocrisy I hate. You know, like I say, uh, you know, you know, the, Yeah, shitty entity. They never tell you what they're thinking, never tell you what's on them, never tell you the truth. Shitty entity. With all these pastors coast to coast lying every day on their pulpits, shitty entity. Never tell you anything. They just say, oh yeah, we know how to get along in the world. Shitty entity. Well, thank God persecution's coming. But look at them all now. All these people that used to say Jesus, they're going um, spirit or God or, you know, new age terms. It's, it's amazing the denial going on. Oh, I'm not with him. 
I don't know him. Don't worry, I haven't found Jesus or anything like that. You can still hire me to be, uh, you know, uh, a stripper in Vegas. I mean, you know, no, and I don't judge any of that. And I'm, I don't even judge the porn. I say, you know, keep doing the porno films. I don't, you know, it's to me, there isn't anything like that. I, my, you know, uh, bubble was burst, <laughs> cherry was burst when I was, you know, four, three. It just took me all this time, you know, a lot of time to process it all because like a lot of people, I just wanted to believe in America and, you know, baseball and um, not Santa Claus, but I wanted to think that, you know, you didn't need Satan's help to go do something in the world that you could go fishing or you could do this or you could do that. I, I just wanted to believe you could go into Hollywood and direct a movie or you could you could uh, sing or you could dance, you, you, could, you could create a product, that you could do any of those things without entangling into this whole, you know, but it's, you know, and people make their decisions. I mean, there, there are people that pay the insurance so they'll be left alone, and these people are not Satanists. They're paying the insurance so they won't be wiped out, so they're kind of, you know, and that's the majority, I'd say, and looking the other way, which makes the corruption grow. And then there's the people that resist it completely and then they're considered crazy. And then there's the people that are um, embrace it all the way. And that's the oath to Lucifer. And that's, you know, the, 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 the hardcore thing in terms of spirit because you're basically, you know, throwing your life away. You're throwing your soul away. No, you're not giving anything away. When, when, they, when they, you know, the way the world works is, you know, when you're young, they want your sex, they want your body, they want you to give all that away. But, you know, um, when you give your soul away, you're not giving anything away. You're losing something that you can't get back. And all these musicians that are your heroes of the, the albums you go by, they, um, <laughs> never mind. So I had my eyes open to all that and I, and I realized that I, it was time in my life I came to peace with it. I had a lot of, you know, because all I had as a kid were memories of that sort of thing. I mean, you know, that's all that was going on. So, you know, there were good memories laced in there and, and, and people I did like you know, along the way. And uh, then there were predators, you know, like everywhere, psychopaths and predators. And, and they were, you know... Um, uh, you know, wanting uh, whatever. They, they they want the world. They want to be able to do whatever they, they damn well please within it. And they want the protection to do just that. And they want the wealth and power to pull it off. And sure, that seems like just about everybody that was on the path of trying to get, you know, money and this and that. But they're not all that way. Like I say, you know, a lot of, you know, people that are fairly, you know, well off who do not bow down to those things who who deal honestly and they've they've and they have longevity in their businesses unlike the other people like the people that grab for the gold by giving up their souls and 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 being you know giving up their consciences and things like that all these guys wound up broke and broken I wish I had told that guy, that editor, hey, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Now that you're on your knees anyway, let's pray. I wish I I could have gotten on my knees right. I love a spectacle. Let's all get on our knees in the in the booth at the at the photo uh, at the uh, photo finish line uh, uh, box at uh, you know at uh, Santa Anita. Let's all get on our knees and start praying to Jesus. <laughs> They'll think you're praying to Jesus so you can be a winner. <laughs> But all in all, in looking at it in that microcosm of humanity and seeing the humanity there is, I, I suppose instead of calling you know America the stupidest nation on earth, I, I you know that had in other words they had everything you know Americans had everything you know opportunity and just a tremendous um, you know place on earth and and to hire people who just want to destroy it and punish the people here. And then cheer it on as you're, 
being docked as well. The people who are cheering it on are also being destroyed. I, I just, I understand it on a certain level. I really do. You know, um, but the idea of giving up America to be a slave in order to not piss off the mob-driven entertainment society that spews out um, uh, political correctness in our society. Who are the last people that are politically correct? Like I said, all these mobsters and gangsters and actors and actresses and, and jockeys and trainers and horse owners and all this stuff at the racetrack, one thing kind of united all of them, you know, in my experience, they were all 100% Americans. I mean, they were capitalists. You know what I mean? I think that's why we admire the mafia movies. That's understandable to me. This other thing of self-destruction is not... With, 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 with the, the thing I always hate, which is this hoity-toity, nose-in-the-air, um, holier-than-thou, self-righteous attitude while, you know, doubling down on the stupidity and calling it genius, like the news media agencies who are calling Obama genius, and that he's just too smart for the rest of us. We can't really understand his ways because he's he's just a cut above. And I'm going, he's a cut above intellectually? He's nothing but a, a street thug. <laughs> he's, you know what I mean? He's like the guy you hire to deal the drugs in the corner. I mean, you know, this is, this is nobody that understands... He contradicts himself every five minutes on policy. He has no policy. He's unstable in every way. It's almost like the movie, remember the movie Being There with Peter Sellers? Chauncey Gardner? He's like an articulate version of Chauncey Gardner. You know, if he hears some rhetoric in the air, he just, it becomes his own. He spews it, even though it would contradict something he said a week ago. And he puts his hand in the air, whichever way the wind blows, then he'll start spouting that rhetoric. It's all about, you know, ultra campaigning and continuing to campaign to get all his agenda through, which would be the punishment of not just America, but the entire world, if possible. Because the man has a chip on his shoulder. And he is a man. And I want to get into more spiritual issues now. And, and I suppose we should pray in Jesus' name. I pray, thank you, Father, for giving me the words to get that out and off my chest in the name of Jesus as I've come to peace and forgiveness and love for all these people that uh, I had known. Some were kind of nasty, so there's forgiveness there, but I mean, you know, the ones that were good, who had hearts of gold despite the fact of being compromised. I just pray that all their eyes are open, even though most of these are dead now, I know, but that their children, their offspring, that the system still goes on that there would be an enlightenment that would occur, that they would realize that you, Father, are not the evil one. I just wish that could happen, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So, to our political religion, Obama, um, he's not the Antichrist, he's not the man of perdition. I'll keep it open, you know, to correction, if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm really, you know, saying. And um, in terms of the times and all that, um, he's not the man of perdition. He's not the Antichrist. I think they tried, you know, I think Hawaii during the end of the Mayan calendar was an important thing. I know these these pagans are always doing their rituals with the sun and the moon and the stars and everything. And it's all tied with the pyramids and the ancient religion and blah, 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 blah. The aliens are all involved. And yeah, it just, it's just, it's not anything that I would take seriously. You know what I mean? And, and I don't really feel threatened by it. I just see that, um, that they're more religious than you Christians. They do the rituals and they do their prayers and chanting and stuff while you do nothing. They're very fervent about the times and the stars and the places upon the earth and the PowerPoints on the earth of where they have to be to do these rituals. And they do them fervently. And in this case, I don't know that they understand, the guy that they picked, Obama, is not the one they were waiting for. He's not the Antichrist. 
He's not the man of perdition. He never will be. And they are just beginning to start figuring that out, which means look out, Obama. That machine that you've been riding at the head of, like the, like the, the, you know, the dragon's head, uh, can turn right on you on a dime. They're very fickle. If they ever figure out you're not the AC, uh, your political career is basically over. Unless they figure they could use you as a, you know, as a puppet in, in, after your presidency is over. But he's just a man, and um, he, he's a pretty good charlatan, but then again, they all are. He's in the tradition of Bush. He's in the tradition of Clinton. He's the same in the same line as them, and this is the one they propped up. And I do think that uh, Oprah was really hoping at one point that he was, you know, now she's just, you notice Oprah has already distanced herself from all this. She's not saying he's the one we've been waiting. You know what I mean? She's di I don't see him as black or white or anything. I just see it as more like, you know, through the, that's all a veil. You see through all that to what they are spiritually. Anyway, he's just a man and he's just trying to hold power. He's trying to hold on to power by appeasing the people that put him there. And the, the people that put him there really wanted him to be the one because Frank Marshall Davis being his father and, you know, being through this whole commie thing, and he came up through, I'm sure, all the ritual abuse. He did fine. Masonic handshake at Punahou School when he was graduating. You know, kind of like a made his, his, you know, mentors of Bill Ayers and Zbigniew Brzezinski, CIA contacts, all this stuff to be groomed to be president. All his life, he was taught that he was groomed to be. They, they've been waiting for him all his life, and the Communist Party was thinking that he was the one, and they were all waiting for him to come of age. So for them... He is the man of perdition. He is, and they don't call him the Antichrist. For him, they would be the Christ, the Messiah, the new Pharaoh, the new Messiah. That's, they had hopes on him like that since he was a kid. So he's got to do everything. He's got to do his song and dance every day so people believe that he really is that guy. And all over the internet, you have people going, he's the guy, he's the guy, he's the guy. And all that's doing is aiding and abetting this whole mythology that they're trying to create. Anyway, he's just a man. The sheen is gone and the thrill is gone. And it's just, you know, you Republicans, a lot of them are in bed with, you know, the mob and special interests and this and that. And so they're, you know, you don't get it, you know, left, right paradigm. It's, you know, they're all the same in a way. You know, there's a few that stand out. All I'm saying is the problem is with all the yelling and screaming and fighting and shouting, if he ain't the guy, then all this is moot. And that's why I believe, so from a spiritual perspective, from a prophetic perspective, my prophetic perspective, which I, I, I'm sure could be wrong, you know, I'm, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, you know, I don't tend to be wrong too often, I mean, I make mistakes. But in this regard, um, I'm pretty good at, at reading this kind of thing that goes on like this, you know. He's not the guy. So this may not be the time. Those who have said we're in tribulation back in 2010 or 9 or whatever, Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah at seven years hence, incorrecto. They're wrong. In many ways, it was darker in 1955 than it is here in 2013. I'm sorry. I don't expect that I will have um, that, you know, usually when I talk like this, oh, and yeah, there's no rapture the way that it's envisioned. So, you know, when I talk like this, they leave in droves. I, you know, I'm, I can clear the room of 10,000 listeners in one second just by saying what I just said. You know, the, the big part of the consummation wedding feast and the return of Christ is within you and this kingdom is within you it's it's really quite profound of uh you know Luke 17:21 or whatever it is uh it it really means that reality is within you and that what we see in the outside world is kind of an illusion but it's part of a created illusion for a purpose of Yahweh that's that's mysterious to us 
We know there's suffering and we don't like it. Life on earth is suffering. That's the first tenet of Buddhism. All life is suffering. And that, you know, the way out of suffering for the Buddhist is to live a righteous life. Amen. If, if only we would take our Ten Commandments as seriously as they take their Eightfold Path, we would be in a lot better shape. And we don't do that. You know, I mean, the Lord expects us to come to, to Jesus. He draws us when he draws us. In other words, I can't make someone go to Jesus. It's, it's not going to happen. Evangelism doesn't really work. It's, it's, it has to be the Lord, the Father has to draw you for something to happen there. But then, of course, as the work is getting done, then the sins should fall away. The balance should come to people's lives. You live a good life. You deal with people honestly. You say you're in business. You've got a product. You've got something. You're going to do 10 times the sales of that thing by, by living an honest life. And the sad thing about all these mobsters and gangsters and, and the actors and the film editor, the producer, they're up and down. They wound up mostly being broken. That's, that's the thing I've been, I guess the one theme that I saw as a kid that I never really was able to process is by and large, they all wound up broke. Everything they sold out for was taken when they were in, uh, and their later years were really a struggle. They, in other words, they got a, kind of a, a slice of hell. And all the people that were honest, you know, and straight shooters and, you know, considered squares and don't want to talk to them, they've done well and they've rejuvenated in many cases and they've, they've kept on. I'm not saying that, you know, people haven't bowed down to Satan here and there as because they didn't have the Lord, like I say, paying insurance. These people can be redeemed. If you go all the way and you just are a child of the devil, then, then you're not looking for redemption, so you already are redeemed in, in, in that sense, and, and I'm not going to judge that because that's, that belongs to the Lord, not me. People would say, well, it's the whole world. This iniquity you talk about is the whole world. I have a vape stick going here. It's uh, water vapor as opposed to um, tobacco cigarettes or something like that. I've, you know, One is harmless and one can potentially harm. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that we can't be like Alex Jones in a sense as, as really God-fearing people and I'm not, no, I'm not putting him down. I'm just saying with this, I, the, the, trying to fight it all yourself is what I mean. He's trying to single-handedly fight it all himself and he, and, he, and he gets upset and he cries on the air and he's wailing for justice and, and it seems like justice is out of reach and you know, it's like, please don't hurt our children. You know, it, it's, it, I understand totally where he's coming from and my heart goes out to him, it really does. But that, we just can't have that attitude going forward. We can't have that attitude of what we see on the news is really the, the political scene and that we're just doomed. This thing existed when I was born, and you too. And it had gripped the whole world. And it influenced everything from politics to science. Every, everything was gripped by it well, well before, a thousand years before you were born and before that. And it was the whole world. Sodom and Gomorrah was just simply a metaphor for the world is all. And it, it, like I say, when they're pure-hearted kids would commit suicide, they'd see, oh my God, it's so big, I can't overcome that. And they were right. They're wrong to commit the suicide. Their only overcomer is Jesus Christ, and in him we overcome right now, today. And then once you've overcome the world, you can forgive the world. Did any of those people do anything to me, really? No, they did what they would do, just like a shark does what he does. A wolf does what he does. They, the mob, the, 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 the criminals running, the, the, you know, the bosses of the cities, and the, the, they do what they do. That's, that's their world. I'm sure if I were born into another world of, say, farmers that were God-fearing, this, we wouldn't be talking about this because it wouldn't exist. And yes, there were children that, you know, got right with it and saw the way the wind was blowing and they just thought it was cool and they jumped right on it. And um, 
you know, they've, they've gone to where they've gone, but one of these days they're going to have to realize they're all alone. And when I'm alone and I'm in sorrow and trouble, I call upon the Lord and he comforts me and he guides, he teaches me and he dries up my tears and he sets me aright. And when I'm afraid, I intone Psalm 23 and I'm okay. When I'm feeling uh, really good, I ask the Lord to help sustain that so I can have a little more fun or enjoy life a little more. But in every case, I have a place to go. In every case, I have, I'm not alone. In every case, I feel blessed because I'm not alone, that I have a place to go. Because I personally, you know, like Alex Jones, I can't really take looking at this thing head on like he does. I mean, the way he does it, I, I could not do what he does. He looks at all the research and it all points to a certain thing. And he takes it right on the, right in the, he takes it right on the chin every day. He'll do the research and get freaked out, which anyone would do. And then he'd go squawk about it on the air and he'd be disturbed and he'd have guests on to, to share and say, yep, Alex, we really are screwed, Gerald Salente. Yep, Alex, it really is bad. Or this, this other guy he had on recently, you know. But again, we, it's the wheat and the tares go together, but also the good and the bad go together. There's also a good side. It's just not all dark. It's 80-20 dark when you really look at it that the, the goodness is more rare than the darkness. You know, the light is rarer than the darkness because it's artificially skewed during this time of satanic occupation. But the human being, any of you, any of you, I don't care, New Agers, Christians, Buddhists, whatever, atheists, uh, agnostics, uh, uh, device-oriented people that you're just into the cyber arena, that's your God. All of you people, and me, and everybody, we shouldn't bow down to the one who hates us. Right? We shouldn't participate in our own self, in our own destruction. We shouldn't, I mean, you know, I understand if the pressure's on, you have to kind of like get your way out of it. And I'm not against that. I mean, I don't think people should just go blathering anything and everything so they can have someone kill them. I, you know, that, that's not even martyrhood. That's just, that's, that's winning the Darwin Award of stupidity. I mean, you know, to make a joke. I'm just saying, well, we seem to be doing that as a nation, don't we? Oh, it's our fault. Yeah, these, we, we took the research. You know, there's, there's this whole ethos going on and they're trying to make it a political fight that we really owe. But we shouldn't participate in the destruction of our souls. We should recognize that there are more important things that if God wants us to have that fame, fortune, this, that, the other thing, he'll give it to us. We shouldn't judge criminal, the criminal element of the world, or if you like the satanic element, same thing, because it's been here since the beginning. We're gawking at something and, and criticizing it or judging something, thinking that our voice might make a difference, but it won't. The only thing that makes a difference in that regard is the growth, growing forth of the kingdom or the love of God amongst the people, and that love is what changes things. Not war and yelling at the enemy. I've yelled at the enemy for years. It's done me, well, it got me a lot of friends who also felt the same way, but you, you know, that didn't help any of us, did it? it? Didn't help any of us. Yelling and screaming about the corruption and everything, you know, it would be better to put to be more proactive and lead forth with your ideas and the way you are rather than railing against Obama because that, that's just like railing against the shark for eating the, the, the tuna or, the, or, or whatever the sharks do. That, that's what they do. What Obama is, what he was made to be, is very clear to me from day one. I don't see, there, no one had to explain it. I didn't need, uh, what, what's that guy's name? Corsi, is that that investigative journalist, Trish? Jerome Corsi, is that the investigative journalist? 
Yeah. I don't need Jerome Corsi to tell me the thing about the birth certificate or whatever else about Obama and his life. And, or people to say that the father that he said on the thing, birth certificate isn't really the real, it's really this other guy that they were having orgies with. It doesn't matter to me. You see a man's character on day one. If he vacillates, contradicts himself, he's, if he's double-minded and unstable, you know, then, then, then that's what it is. And it's always going to lead to trouble for the people. There's a man not fit to lead. Okay, that's they, but they want him there so that it will be a punishment. Fine. Okay, fine. I get it. Point is, is you, I don't want to put energy into constantly going Obama versus then the supporters of Obama. We No one gets anywhere. Just got to give it a pass. I mean, all the mobsters and all the people that I kind of grew up with and all that, I just give it all a pass. You know, they're acting the way that they're supposed to act. It's sad when they fall. It's sad when they're broken men and, 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 and broke after, you know, running and gunning all their lives and having the girls and having the limos and having, you know, and then having nothing, seeing them then begging at the racetrack. Um, and then knowing the cause, knowing the root cause of all that, you will reap what you sow. You know, honesty and integrity and, you know, people that live like that, their businesses do well and they sustain throughout their lives. Isn't that interesting? They didn't take the shortcut. A lot of these gamblers are always looking for a quick fix. They're always taking a shortcut and they're always getting further down, further down, further down. You know, the Lord will reward those who are, you know, uh, if you think that honesty and integrity is being square or staying out of the satanic orgy is square or, or not busted a move to get somewhere to be a celebrity is square, there's a lot more people living good lives in the end of their 60s, 70s. That's the best insurance policy there is for health insurance, I can tell you right now. But in my own seeing all that when I was a kid, I just have to tell you, it wasn't all bad. And like I say, the mobsters seem to be the most honest of all. And then the, the nicest people to children and everything else. It was these hypocrites that were the most perverted and strange and betraying. Even though the mobsters there were doing everybody's dirty work. It, yeah, well, say about it what you will. Whatever. It gave me... Um, a foundation of understanding the world so that I can now, at long last, give it a, just say, it's okay. You know, God's got it in his hands. He will be the one that takes care of it. You know, this corruption was natural to man. It's, it's the, the unnatural thing is being honest. The unnatural thing is being, is having integrity. The unnatural thing is having, you know, is a striving for, for, for the Lord. And, you know, all, the, all those things are supernatural. You could only do them if the Lord gave you the strength to do it. The natural way of man is criminality. The natural way of man is to lie, cheat, and steal. The natural way of man is to covet the neighbor's wife. The natural way of man is to break the commandments. The natural way of man is to, is to break commandments and break social mores and morals in order to get ahead. You know, the, the, they live by the moniker and the creed, uh, and the credo, nice guys finish last. So they're not nice guys in that sense. But I think the Lord frowns more on the hypocrites than the people that are just abject criminals. And my proof is the thief on the cross. He would be emblematic or representative of the mob, the typical mob guy. You know, he's uh, been running and gunning his whole life. He finally came to understand that's the Messiah and I need help because I'm a sinner. And he's saved, and the Lord's very happy to save him. While the Lord rails against what? Well, who, who does Jesus rail against in, in the Bible? He, who's the number one people he rails against? High society, the priests, meaning the, these are like the politicians, the power brokers, the, 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 the people that act like they've never done one thing in their lives, one wrong thing. It's those people that he rails against. He's not railing against the thief on the cross. He's not railing against sinners, but hypocrites is his number one target. I think maybe hypocrisy, and we've all done it, you know, to a certain extent. It's natural for a man to be a hypocrite. Natural to, to, to hide your sins and put on a good face for, for the world. 
that there's not that but it, when it gets to be a high art of you know you're just as much of a scumbag as the mafia and you're acting like you're just clean as a whistle give me a break that that is where the lord i believe these people are of the, the worst judgments reserved for them for example being you know quote in the illuminati which again is a term it's like the the dude that's a term no one self applies where i come from in other words a guy calls himself the dude so that's a name that no one self applies it's like i'll call you dude you call me dude but no one just calls himself the dude um so the illuminati is not a name that you know people say well that's the illuminati um but that's a very loose term that's like a term that's not really in existence among these people they're more likely to call themselves the club the association the agreement the um the the old boy club network or whatever you know, rather than the Illuminati, which is just giving them just too much of a hoity-toity, that's giving it too much. It's man's natural inclination to be a criminal, to, to go against the law, to go against morals, to get ahead to, because he wants to, to have. But when you make those compromises to have, what happens is it usually, you know, some smarter person comes along and steals it all from you. Finally, we have to take these blessings we get. Like if your business is doing well and if you're, you know, or your job or your whatever, you know, it's the Lord that's causing that to happen. There needs to be a gratitude for that and to not take it for granted, but to, to keep on it every day and say, thank you for that provision. Thank you for that roof over my head. Thank you for those good people that are involved in my life. Thank you for protecting me because I couldn't protect myself from getting screwed. Thank you, Father. Thank you for showing me who to trust and who not. Thank you for guiding me through this, this, this minefield of troubles that can come upon any person at any time. The street always thinks you got to conform, you know, in order to, you know, speak the lingo and make the moves. And that's, I've seen that that's not really the case for longevity. It's a case perhaps for a short term pop, but in terms for a, a, a whole life, it's not really to live a whole life with one soul given over only to die without that soul would, to me, be a, a tragic. How do you know you have your soul? Well, does, is, do you love the Lord? I think if you love the Lord, you have a soul, don't you? You'd ha it's really your soul that loves the Lord, isn't it? When you're in trouble, do you call upon the Lord? Well, then you probably have a soul. The Bible says, don't rely on your own understanding, but, but, but just be like a little child in God, with God's leading. Okay, well, the world doesn't think that way. They rely on their own logic. So I can make case after case after case after case, but the thing I won't do at this point is judge those who took the bait for Satan because you weren't there. You don't know their circumstances. In the circumstances of my grandparents, for example, they were dirt poor. And they wanted to make something of themselves and they did what they thought was right to do. And later tragedy struck when they realized that the choices they made were not maybe the best for their souls. And they, they became perverse and tragic. You know, but that, when they were 18 years old, that's what they, they decided. They were going to somehow make something of themselves. And, uh, you know, they needed to get, you know, off the streets and into, uh, it was all motivated by poverty. They, so how can I judge that? You know, yes, later on, there's a dark side. People have to do bad things. There's dirty work that has to be done to get, to go up the ladder. Yeah, sure. But how can I judge it? You know, isn't that na man's natural inclination to try to better his lot and to not just agree to live in poverty and, you know, they, maybe they prayed and, and, you know, 
God was not going to relieve them of that poverty, so they would themselves. I think we can all understand that. And I come to a better understanding of it, having remembered a lot of this stuff from watching this film and then realizing I even know somebody out there that uh, was raised on the on the horses and thoroughbreds and different things. It was all a part of her family and culture. And, and um, I never really, when she would talk about the horses and things in an email or so I never really wrote back that I about my own situation because I sort of blocked it out the, yeah that, yeah going to the uh, going to school with the, the racing form there and the, the thing and the the guy on the yeah I mean it was like a a constant thing of people handicapping the horses handicapping the horses I mean and uh, having books and books and books of stats uh, that were kept and glued into these little ledger books so you go back and look up a horse that you might be running and you can go back a couple of years and say, oh, okay, ran in this race, that race, whatever. Uh, and I also value, and I thank the Lord for showing me at an early age, the entire cross-cut section of humanity, the winners and the losers, the fame, the glory, and the gutter, all at once to show the whole thing so I understood it's a microcosm so that one day I would be able to say, I've seen the entire world and I understand. And because I was you know, on, on an inside situation there, I can't really judge it because I understand the motivation of any of them. They were just, you know, I guess the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but it's perfectly understandable. Every single motivation of every single person that I ever encountered in my youth. And when they kill the horse that goes lame, that, that breaks his leg, looks to me like, you know, that's kind of being used as a metaphor for, uh, you know, the pure hearts out there, for the lambs. Because, you know, in a sense, the, 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 you know, the horses are pure hearts. They just run. <clears throat> it's, it's all this stuff that man's doing to them that causes, you know, this system is doing to them, this gambling is doing, this, this criminal cabal is doing to them causing them to break their legs and have and these different things to happen to them. And then it's man who must inject into the carotid artery that uh, big euthanizing drug and within 30 seconds, the horse is dead. They shoot horses, don't they? It's just a metaphor for, you know, Lambs to the slaughter. In other words, the pure hearts, the people that don't see this, the people that aren't part of that system, are usually the ones that wind up being sacrificial victims, just like the horses are victims of the people that want to have the gambling. And But it's understandable they want to have the gambling because everyone wants to get rich. So let's let this day be a day where we just look at the quote Illuminati, which they don't refer to themselves as, but you can look at that and say, you know what? There but for the grace of God. This just seems to me, you know, same thing with Obama. If I was raised in the circumstances he was raised in, I'd probably be, you know, more um, fervent, let's say, for his cause than he is. Um, and we look at it and we go, I can't believe how America's doing this and doing that. I've had friends who ran guns and were assassins and things. I've known people, and I can't blame them. I can't really, it's right now in this particular spot I'm in, I can't blame anyone for any of the choices they make, but choices do have consequences. Again, honesty and integrity. Choose God, and he will help you to be honest and integrity. And those are the people that have longevity. The people that don't follow those simple paths, the simple rules, the simple rules laid down in Proverbs or the Psalms, uh, you know, or the, or the edicts of the Bible, which is instruction. You know, you, you, you have a good result. You have faith in the Lord and you do the right thing. And, you know, they may not like you because you're not embracing that, you know, you, or they might, I don't know. But I, I know this, that if Jesus went to the racetrack, um, he wouldn't be hated 
Now, the, the, they, the propaganda about Jesus makes people hate this idea, but he himself wouldn't be hated at all. He would be welcomed at least by, I know the mob would welcome him. <laughs> because none of them actually feels great about what they're doing either. They're just all kind of caught up in it. And that was the feeling. That was what I really liked about the movie. It wasn't judging or moralizing about the, the situation. It was just looking at what is. It's the same way that Coppola kind of looked at uh, the Godfather series. You know, it was just really a mature way of looking at humanity without, without coloring it one way or the other, just more or less showing us what the scene was. And it was very accurate. You know, Luck, the, the HBO series, which was canceled. Of course it was canceled. It, it was just... It was just too pure in its uh, integrity of showing just what's going on and not coloring it in such a way to, so that we, the audience, would be, along with the director, making a judgment. Boy, isn't that evil. Glad we're not. As humanity, we see we have a lot of this stuff in common with each other. You know, it's man's natural way to do the wrong thing, let's say takes wisdom and, and instruction to learn to do the right thing even when everyone else is doing the wrong thing. I think Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem about that. A real man and a real woman, a real emancipated man is one who when the crowd is going one way, he doesn't necessarily go that way. He sticks to, to his guns and sticks to his integrity. If everyone's running after the devil, he won't. Even if it means persecution of himself, that's a real man. That's emancipation to manhood. Manhood is not having a career path. Manhood is not selling out so that you can have X, Y, or Z. Manhood is not accepting the way it is um, and just saying, okay, that's it, I'll just make the best deal, like when in Rome. Manhood, adulthood, womanhood, whatever, is um, doing the right thing even when everyone else is going the wrong way, even when everyone else has justified it. But, and in, 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 in so doing, not judging the other people who've done it by their natural inclination. Man is naturally more like a brute beast. He'll just go which way the, the wind is blowing. That's the natural way of man. It's unnatural for man to have, and you know, to come to integrity and morals and different things and live by that kind of code and um, not impose his will and not kowtow through conformity to um, various people's idea of, you know, uh, of joining into the, to the corruption to better his lot. Uh, that's the natural way of man. We can't blame man for that. We really can't. You can't blame man for going his natural way. Only God can actually pull you to a higher course. You, we can't do it. And when that happens, there's persecution because people feel like you know your existence exposes them and then they feel guilty and then they want to react in some way. So they killed the prophets and they, you know, they're going to make war on the saints, the Bible says, you know, because the, you know, they, they, they want to kill those two witnesses, even though those two witnesses are, you know, doing, um, you know, untouchable for a while. They, mm -hmm. they basically um, want to snuff out anything that has light so that they are not bothered. But if everybody ran that way, I contend, and I, I promise you this would be the case, there wouldn't be a humanity to talk about if everyone ran that way because there'd be no reason to sustain it by the living God. I mean, they only exist because people of God exist in the first place that have a chance and God is allowing them to have a chance despite this world or even because of it to, to be brought up as the saints of the Lord, as his children, you know, in this environment that is nearly impossible almost like a weed growing through the concrete on the freeway, or this green uh, or tree coming up out of the concrete where it shouldn't. And I think the Lord has the last laugh. I think he, he makes things happen where log human logic defies it. How come he's doing it? You know, how come they're working out for them? I did everything I was supposed to do and it's not working out for me, but look, it is for them. And then you have the Cain and Abel jealousy. And Obama's tried to stoke up the Cain and Abel class warfare, jealousy, race wars, whatever. It's all an attempt to garner power because he's a, you know, he is what he is. And that's all I'm going to say. I'll see you next time.